From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Ophthalmology Author Interviews. Conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinions featured in JAMA Ophthalmology. Hello, and welcome to this author interview from the JAMA Network. I'm Neil Bressler, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA Ophthalmology. And today, we're going to be discussing the incidence of glaucoma-related adverse events in the first five years after pediatric lensectomy. Joining us is the first author of that study, Dr. Eric Bothan. He was working with the Pediatric Eye Disease Investigator Group and is a professor of ophthalmology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Bothan, thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be here to share a little bit about what makes the PEDIC network special and also this result that we're finding in terms of pediatric cataract and risk of glaucoma. So I greatly appreciate the opportunity and to share and to be with you. Maybe then you can tell me a little bit about PEDIG for a minute. What is this PEDIG or Pediatric Eye Disease Investigator Group? Yes, PEDIG is a research consortium that was established about 25 years ago or so, stemming from a group of ophthalmologists and optometrists that came together to answer some clinical questions regarding treatment for six nerve palsy, for amblyopia. They developed a collaboration and started working with the JABE Center, which is a research institute in Florida, well supported by the National Eye Institute for their work, and over the last many decades have chosen research protocols to prospectively study a wide range of conditions and treatment options, whether it's in showing the role of atropine versus patching, whether it's treating strabismus with one muscle versus two, whether it's the use of botulinum toxin or uh, new modalities for amblyopia treatment with binocular treatments. Many of these have been proactive treatment studies, but a number of them have been more observational registry-based evaluations and using this network of optometry and ophthalmology practices across the country In academia and private practice, it's become a vehicle to study outcomes in ways that individual institutions are not able. And it has the statistical and planning arm of the JABE Center to help each of these studies take wings and land with successful outcomes, statistical support that it just helps them succeed. So one of the more recent appreciations has been over the years, the continued awareness about our need to understand the risks and the treatment options for pediatric cataract. So that led to this particular registry that we're reporting from today. Well, that leads us right to this study. So this is one of those studies that was not necessarily a clinical trial, but a longitudinal observational study. Is that correct? That's correct. So the study design was to allow investigators to enroll children after a cataract was performed. If any cataract was performed in a practice in these pediatric ophthalmology practices around the country, they were allowed to be enrolled and tracked for five years. The etiology of the cataract may have been diverse, whether it's traumatic, congenital, related to a metabolic condition along the way, and the management choice of what type of cataract surgery was performed, whether it was inserting in a primary intraocular lens or not, was up to investigator discretion. So it became a true registry, a prospective registry, longitudinal by, uh, in these practices around the country, representing, I would say, what current level of care of community care is across the United States. In this case, in this particular study, I think we had 61 centers enrolling their pediatric cataract patients over a number of years of enrollment. Now, in this investigation, you and your group looked specifically at glaucoma-related adverse events five years after these pediatric cataract surgeries. Now, why look for that specific adverse event? Was it known how often that happens? Was it not known? Do we need to learn about that? Why that specific adverse event? Yeah, it's a great question. And many people recognize the success that ophthalmology has had in advancing care of cataract work across all populations and all age groups. Oftentimes, pediatric ophthalmology 
gleams the best from the adult population and we utilize these techniques in children, there have been times in the decades past where efforts in pediatric cataract were felt to be so limited that in certain situations, you might choose conservative care in a unilateral cataract in the 1970s or 80s. But over the decades, we've done things better and better and better. With better outcomes become an ability to study where can we further improve. And one of the elephants in the room, whenever we do cataract surgery on a child, is that they may get glaucoma. And so you have a beautiful structural outcome and you may be dealing with the sensory issues of amblyopia or strabismus, but by golly, when you fight for vision and then you get glaucoma that's trying to take that vision away, it's incredibly frustrating. Over the recent decades, there have been some landmark articles coming out of prospective research groups, uh, the one being the infant aphakia treatment study, that have looked at specific age groups, say just the infants or just the toddlers or just, and what we find is there's different risks. And these have shown that children in the first months of life have the highest risk of glaucoma and children that are older have lesser risk because some children that are older get lenses inserted in their eyes where younger kids commonly are left aphakic and are treated with contact lenses. There has been a season where people have thought maybe if we put the lens inside, it's protective of glaucoma. And I think we've largely shown that it's, that's probably not the case. It's more of an age effect of when surgery is performed. But it has left the question of when does the risk drop? What are the highest risk categories that we need to worry about glaucoma and should it affect our management? So the PDIG, with the power of all these sites, said, let's gather more data than has ever been gathered in one registry here in the United States into a group that we could study and try to answer some of these questions. Thus, one of the articles coming out from this database is glaucoma-related outcomes. And why five years? It's because that's where we cut the study off to gather the bulk of the data on these children. So it sounds like pediatric ophthalmologists have been doing cataract surgery in infants for a long, long time, and that they realize anecdotally that some of their patients, unfortunately, are getting glaucoma, but we just didn't know exactly how many or how severe or what it might be associated with. So how did you do the study? You identified people around the country that were undergoing pediatric cataract surgery. And how many did you end up enrolling in terms of eyes or patients or both? We had across the network, a strength of the pediatric eye disease investigator group is that we have relationships with these academic and private practice institutions and individuals, and we tapped into those resources. We didn't have to go looking for investigators. We asked the investigator group, do you perform cataract surgery and would you like to start enrolling in this new study or in this particular way? And as I, I think it was ended up being about 61 of the sites chose to enroll patients prospectively, it was opened up. And as they did their cataract surgery, if they decided after the surgery then to enroll them, they were allowed uh, longitudinally to be placed into that registry. In the end, I think we ended up having 1,050 eyes in this current study on 811 children. The number was originally a little bit larger than that. I think it was 1,300 some eyes. But to learn about the impact of surgery on a child's eye to risking glaucoma, we eliminated eye conditions that separately elevated the risk of glaucoma, whether it was prior trauma or genetic conditions like low syndromes. That's a low, low has a, has a risk of cataract and a risk of glaucoma. So we eliminated some of those groups. So in the end, we had, I think this current study had 811 children with over a thousand eyes to enroll. Of those, about a third ended up having aphakic eyes, eyes that did not receive a lens primarily, and the rest had eyes that had a primary intraocular lens was placed at the time. So before we get to the confounding factor that you already mentioned, that 
younger children tend to be managed with aphakia and contact lenses and older children tend to be managed with pseudophakia. What did you actually find was the incidence over five years of a glaucoma-related adverse event? Let's say in the aphakic children and then in the pseudophakic children. What was that event rate and were you surprised by that? The aphakic group, so these were children that were predominantly children that had surgery in the first two years of life. So it isn't that from this cohort of kids that had from birth to age 13, that was our upper level of what we were studying here, birth to 13. It wasn't that very many were left aphakic as they were older. For the most part, the infants were often left aphakic. Their eyes are growing. There's other issues and challenges when you put a lens in there. So they were often left aphakic and managed with contact lenses. And the rate of a glaucoma-related adverse event was 29%. In the pseudophagic group, almost all of which older than age two, the risk was 7%. Now, a comment about glaucoma-related adverse events. For anyone listening to this, as you learn about research studies, the definition of outcomes is so important to take a little attention to. So there have been efforts to define what glaucoma means and what glaucoma suspect means. And one could argue because the PEDIG was a very hands-off annual check-in on how children were doing, one definition that could be argued is we overcalled glaucoma because a child that had ocular hypertension treated with a medication, it was thought that if they were being treated, that likely was a, a, could have been a glaucoma situation. Other definitions of glaucoma would put a child with ocular hypertension, even if they're on a medication, but never have structural changes like boopthalmia, cupping, and other myopic shifts would be a glaucoma suspect. The point is, the definition of glaucoma or glaucoma suspect, or glaucoma or ocular hypertension, could be debated in studies. That's why we chose to group them and say all children that are being managed with concerns of ocular hypertension or glaucoma was 29% in children with aphakia and 7% in children with pseudophakia. Your question is, was that surprising? It actually is not. I think this adds a lot of power to what we've seen in other outcomes suggesting about a third of kids in the younger than age two are going to get glaucoma. The more surprising thing for me and many others is that children that are age four, age seven, age 10, some of them got into trouble with ocular hypertension or glaucoma in the glaucoma-related adverse events category to reach a level of 7%. So I would say I was less surprised that the children with aphakia got it, the younger ones, And some people would argue they would kind of raise an eyebrow that there are some of these children in the older group with pseudophagia that we do need to track closely. And do we have clues as to who they may be? What were the risk factors in that older age group that are pseudophagic? I understand the young ones, if it's one out of three, you don't know who that's going to be. And you probably have to follow all of those carefully. Seven out of 100, if that's a true, precise estimate, it's nice to know the risk factors associated. Did you identify any that would help you with the pseudophagic children? Because we had the power in statistical analysis to look at different subgroups, you'd like to think we were able to. And the clear answer is we weren't able to statistically find evidence that you could look more carefully at one group or another in children with pseudophagia. I would like to highlight there have been in the literature various, in the aphakic group, various areas of interest over higher risk. And what this particular study highlighted, some of which new, some of which reinforcing, but upon the aphakic guys, a higher risk was associated with less than age three months, in particular less than six weeks, which 44% of children having a cataract surgery in the first six weeks developed a glaucoma related adverse event. So less than three months for sure. An abnormal anterior segment, something else being wrong in the front of the eye at the time of cataract surgery. A more complicated lensectomy, a complication at the time, iris prolapse or something else that was a tear or rent in the capsule. A more complicated surgery in these younger kids 
were age and bilaterality. So having surgery in both eyes, cataract surgery, versus a child that has only a unilateral cataract, possibly that's because more bilateral cataracts are, have a higher association with genetic and greater ocular comorbidities like microphthalmia or microcornea. But those were the big ones. So let me just make a comment in general, and then I'm going to wrap up with uh, just a couple of other questions, because this is such important information. I would think that this is a good representation of pediatric lensectomy in the United States, given the structure of pedic. So do you think we can generalize this not only to the United States, but through many parts of the world? I do. I think that because this represents so many different surgeons trained at so many different institutions, studying and following glaucoma in a very cohesive way with definition, or not just glaucoma, but other aspects of visual outcomes, and in this particular study, the glaucoma outcomes, it is generalizable to a greater degree than many other registries and prospective studies out of single centers or small groups of centers. So that the strength in representing the current practice of pediatric care, I think has implications in how we move forward to continue to try to address the children at greater risk and find ways to modulate that risk. So Eric, did this change the way you're following these children now in terms of whether they're, let's say the aphakia patients or the pseudophakia patients? Have you changed anything yet as a result of this? Number one, this is hot off the press. So thanks to JAMA, you're going to get this out to people so we can continue to reflect on that question. I do think that there is continued emphasis on how we track children with glaucoma. There have been studies to suggest that there is a spike in glaucoma diagnoses. This was not present in PEDIG, but potentially at age three or four and less so right after surgery. And I think the reason for that is it's harder to examine one and two-year-olds. So sometimes these children are missed and it's not until they get to be age three or four that they're cooperative enough to get a tonal pen pressure. But as shown, and you'll see it in one of the figures in our manuscript, that there is a cumulative incidence that appears to be on the rise both in children with pseudophakia and aphakia, and that rise continues throughout the study. And so these numbers that we're reporting today at five years after have not stopped rising, at least it appears, and likely will continue to rise. And so I guess the one takeaway is monitor all children after lensectomy for glaucoma, and they're likely still not out of the risks, even after they become a, an adult, but certainly if they've moved beyond the first five years of life. And then the only other side question is, we're trying to continue to answer for the youngest kids at the highest rate of glaucoma, it's in the first month or six weeks of life. On the flip side, so we know if we wait longer to do the cataract surgery, because of efforts like this, we can say we're reducing glaucoma risk. On the flip side, dating back decades, we've been aware that you don't want to leave a visually significant cataract in an eye too long because the amblyopia, the deprivational injury to the brain development becomes too much. This study is critical in helping us move forward with that discussion to say, why would we ever do a cataract surgery in the first month of life in a baby? Has that season officially closed because we realize we're elevating a glaucoma risk and it doesn't help the vision risk. So nowadays, most people wait till at least 28 days of corrected birth. And this study would maybe continue to help us say, maybe we should even wait longer, but when does the balance of risk change? And that is a continued area of research and all of us pursuit to the betterment of pediatric cataract outcomes. Well, those sound like some wonderful next steps for you and PDIG, and I cannot thank you enough for discussing all of this with us today. Thank you, Dr. Bothan. Greatly appreciate the opportunity, and just thank you for the support for this exciting outcome and registry progress. Well, we're so appreciative. We've been speaking with Dr. Eric Bothan from the Department of Ophthalmology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where he's a professor of ophthalmology, but also a collaborator and the first author of this article with the PETA group on incidents of glaucoma-related adverse events 
In the first five years after pediatric lensectomy, we've certainly learned that all of these children are going to need careful follow-up watching for glaucoma. I'm Neil Bressler with JAMA Ophthalmology. This episode was produced by Daniel Morrow at the JAMA Network. The audio team also include Mary Lynn Ferkeluk, Audrey Foreman, Lisa Harden, Hannah Park, Shelley Steffens, and Dr. Linda Brubaker, Senior Editor, Multimedia. Thank you for listening.